By way of introducing our esteemed speaker tonight, I want to begin by referring to the well-known short story on exactitude in science, written in 1946 by Jorge Luis Borges, that illustrates the rise and fall of an empire whose decline was due to a unique form of drawing. In the story, Borges cites a fictional history of this empire that describes their obsession with drawing ever more precise maps of their territory. In order to make the maps more accurately represent the territory they describe, the Cartographer's Guild produces increasingly large maps until finally the maps are exactly as large as and isomorphic with the territory of the empire itself. At this point of maximum precision, however, the maps lose all apparent distinction from the thing they are trying to represent. And in their lack of meaningful difference, they cease to deliver the virtue that we expect from our many varied representations of the world, namely their ability to frame the world in different ways and thus afford new perceptions and understandings. As a result, Borges implies, the citizens of this empire suffer a crisis of perception and in short order, the empire collapses and the vast extents of its territory, as well as its preposterously large maps, fall into ruin. The appeal of this story, I think, is in its ability to depict humanity's quest for precision as both heroic and absurd. It's heroic because it resonates with humanity's aspiration for increasing knowledge about reality, a desire to slowly eliminate the terra incognita that exists at the boundaries of human knowledge. However, it's absurd because that terra incognita is the very source of human imagination. Not just the imaginary monsters that lurk at the edges of ancient maps, but also the imaginary that is the wellspring of humanity's dreams and which incites its pursuit of new possibilities. The fact is there will always be this terra incognita, this imprecise alignment between reality and humanity's perception of it, the horizon beyond which things remain uncertain. It is an anthropic distortion that arises due to humanity's specific position in the world and the limited advantage that position affords. This is what philosophers have long referred to as the epistemological gap between reality and its appearance. While it is the stated aim of science to incrementally close this gap through increasingly precise observation, the fact is that the space of humanity, the space of humanity permanently occupies this gap managing the space between what is and what is possible. Maximum precision is also, in some ways, a form of distortion, since it risks distorting or making strange the appearance of the world that we had previously taken for reality. The more precisely we examine the nature of space, for example, the more it dissipates into foam. The same might be said of the architectural discipline. This is what Rainer Banham observed when he likened architecture to a black box. The more we peer under the hood, the more inscrutable it appears. In this way, architecture is like a quantum wave function that literally possess possesses no precise or definite description prior to its observation. Furthermore, when the eye of the observer causes that wave function to collapse, the resulting condition cannot claim any status as a comprehensive representation. It is just one of many possible states. This is the paradox at the heart of architecture, that any instance of it fails to accurately illuminate what it really is. It is as much the thing illuminated as it is the vast shadow cast by that illumination. In other words, architecture is both about being what it is and, what it's, and struggling to be what it isn't. This paradoxical condition is what I think Michael Webb is uniquely adept at drawing and why I think Michael's drawings are so compelling. I think in their tension between precision and distortion, between certainty and doubt, and between fidelity and estrangement, they depict architecture more accurately than any other form of representation. In other words, what Michael draws so well is architecture's elusiveness. For over half a century, Michael Webb has produced a body of work that, like architecture, eludes easy description. His analytical and projective drawings, design work, and writing have relentlessly interrogated the very nature of architecture and the manner in which we perceive it. His work investigates how this perception is affected by time and motion, including whether observations made while in motion can reveal previously unknown understandings. Accordingly, a major theme in his work has been the car and how its affordances, 
which include the manifestation of new experiences of space, intersect with architecture. His work therefore ruminates at length on architecture's distinction, if any, from such non-canonical space-making technologies and the resulting possibility of redrawing an expanded boundary of the discipline in order to include these technologies as possible forms of architecture. The influence of Michael's work began even while he was still a student at London's Regent Street Polytechnic School of Architecture, now the University of Westminster, where he began studying in 1953. In 1959, drawings of his fourth year student project, the Furniture Manufacturers Association headquarters, were published in Architectural Review, and then in 1960 were featured in the Visionary Architecture Exhibition uh, at the MoMA in New York, curated by Arthur Drexler. Not long after, Kenneth Frampton featured Michael's Sin Palace project in the journal Architectural Design. Around this time, Michael was invited to join the Archigram Group. Criticizing the prevailing architecture in Britain at the time, which it saw as grossly incongruous with changing social and technological realities, Archigram created and disseminated projects that speculated on and challenged other architects to seriously consider the possibility for architecture to incorporate, reflect, and dramatize these contemporary social and technological phenomena. Archigram's uh, work was extremely influential, and in 2006, the group was awarded the gold medal from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Since emigrating to the United States in 1965, Michael has taught at numerous institutions, including Columbia University, the Cooper Union, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, Pratt Institute, Princeton University, the Rhode Island School of Design, and Virginia Tech. His work has also, since this time, been featured in numerous publications and exhibitions. In addition, he was a fellow at the Canadian Center for Architecture from 2010 to 2011, and has received grants from the New York State Council on the Arts and the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts. Last year, Michael's monograph, Two Journeys, was published by Lars Muller Publishers. The book presents Webb's journey, I'm uh, sorry, body of work as a continuum from his time at Archigram until today. This format is appropriate since Michael's ideas and investigations are ones that relentlessly proceed over decades. Michael's tenacious pursuit of architecture as an elusive subject and open question has quietly underwritten many of the more radical, iconoclastic, and thus important endeavors of our discipline during the past 50 years. Meanwhile, the joy embodied in his work, a joy of labor, of discovery, of cleverness, and of possibility, has served as a useful reminder of the pleasure that can be derived from and produced by architecture as a form of speculation and drawing as a means of investigation. As an architect, I'm honored that we were able to welcome one of our discipline's most profound and influential thinkers to our school to speak with us tonight. However, as an educator, I'm perhaps even more delighted that you all will have the opportunity to learn from him this evening. Like others on our faculty and countless others in our discipline, I have been fortunate to have been taught by Michael. In fact, the interaction I had with Michael in grad school was one of the most meaningful educational experiences I've ever had. As I'm sure you will see in his lecture tonight, Michael's keen intellect and shrewd criticism are complemented by a graciousness and wit that are both disarming and empowering, and a curiosity and enthusiasm that are relentless yet infectious. Studying with Michael had such a huge impact on me in both my professional and academic careers, and to this day, he continues to serve as a model for how I would like to be both as an architect and as a professor. In all that I've just said, uh, I have tried, although I fear I've fallen quite short, of conveying to you all how very lucky we are to have him here with us tonight. Please help me in welcoming Michael Webb. Thank you, Michael. Well, all I can say to that is, tough act to follow. That was <laughs> The most comprehensive and penetrating uh, introduction to me that I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing. And I think that's, <laughs> I really mean that. That's wonderful. Um, so I'm going to start with an account of a visit to a cocktail party 
Um, an experience repeated many times. Um, I'm at a, this is the imagining I have. I'm at a cocktail party, or it can be an art exhibition opening, and the stranger has engaged me in conversation. Well, in answer to his or her inevitable question, I say, I'm an architect. But immediately, I experience a sense of dread. I suddenly notice that it's so hot in the room, I feel uncomfortable. I can feel a flush spread up from my neck because I know what the follow-up question is going to be. Yes, here it comes. The countless number of times the follow-up question has been, oh, commercial or residential? <laughs> and I'm, I'm stumped. I don't know what to say. I should know, after all these years, I should have a nice, ready answer, you know, just the, and to really help them understand, and I've decided, after all this time, that I can only say, well, I do drawings. No one has commissioned me to do the drawings, but it's drawings that are inspired or encouraged by things that interest me, that are architectural, sometimes vaguely. And um, my first project I want to show you is actually part of The Third Man, a movie made in 1949, starring Orson Welles. You're terribly young, all of you, but I'm sure you've heard of Orson Welles. Um, wonderful movie. And uh, let me show you the last scene. Oh. I haven't had the microphone on. Can you, what? It is on. Oh, good. Oh, well, oh that's good. Oh, good. Thank God for that. Um, so I'm going to show the first image. There we are. Now, I think I, I've decided that this is actually an avenue in the Vienna Central Cemetery, the Wiener Central Friedhof, taken in 1949. And we see a woman in the far distance walking towards the camera. And there's a young man on her left. He is, uh, his name is Holly Martins, and her name is, well, the star is Alida Valley playing the part of a woman named Anna. And I'm going to read you a short description. Now, the movie made by Carol Reed was intended to have a conventional happy ending. But at the very last moment, and contrary to the wishes of the author, an extraordinary one minute, nine second coda was substituted. It consists of Anna, the female lead, walking towards the camera from what is likely a distance of approximately 500 feet. Now, I've guessed at this number because I used the formula speed multiplied by time equals distance. So if you assume she's doing three miles an hour and she's walking, um, 69 seconds, then she'll have walked the 500 feet, see? Now, there's a problem in her doing this, because what about when she gets to the camera? You see, are we going to fit her with a boxer's mouth guard? Because ideally, she should walk right into the lens, you see, but actually, the ending is a real disappointment because they have her swerve to the left. I mean, to protect her teeth, of course. Um, but which is a real shame. But I, I do want to say, <laughs> I do want to say that of memorable moments from the history of movie making, one of which would be actually Antonioni's movie 
Esquis, where at the end, a couple decide to meet, and their relationship is on the rocks. And they decide to meet at a certain crossroads. And you can imagine the camera setting up there and the movie people. And the time comes that they agreed to meet. And it goes by, first a minute goes by, and the camera's messing around, it's showing what's going on, a rider on horseback, a man mowing the lawn. And actually, neither of them show up, which really tells you all you need to know about the movie, you see. Um, and that this was a superb moment for movie making. But this has to be the other moment. Because after the mayhem of the movie, when there are murderings, beatings up, chases through the sewers of Vienna, a very famous movie for anyone over the age of about 90. Um, but to me, this is a moment of infinite and serene purity after the chaos of the movie. It's extraordinary how they invented this scene. So I'm going to animate it now. Am I just... through the movie is the music of the zither, as is present now. No. <laughs> Wrong. She can't do that. Now you'll notice the young man to her left. In a way, the movie is about her rejection of him. And I think very clearly it shows that she's dumping him. I mean, he doesn't stand much of a chance after that. Poor chap. Um, and so he has lost her, obviously. I mean, it's a way of explaining that she's dumping him. But it's much more than that. There's a serenity about the scene that I think imprints on one's mind forever. Um, but I got very interested in this. I said before that certain facts about life, certain images present possibilities for a drawing and this certainly did. And I did this drawing following because I got interested in the fact of the beginning of the walk. Is if you think of the perspective setup, if you remember from, can we go back actually quickly to, is that safe? Yeah, there we are. Um, there's such a thing now. I went to a school recently, and the students never received any instruction in perspective. And I was a bit surprised about that. Uh, but if you had perspective classes here, you would know that the line of the base of the trees and the top of the trees, when projected back, would meet at the vanishing point. And pretty much her eye, her cyclopean eye, um, is placed over the vanishing point. And as she comes forward, the eye is held on that vanishing point, which is extraordinary. This was a quick invention, the decision to do this particular ending, and the subtlety of it is so extraordinary. And as she comes nearer, her head gets bigger, of course, bigger and bigger, and I felt that what happened was that when she is far distant, the head gets bigger very slowly. And as she gets nearer the camera, the rate of increase of size increases exponentially. 
until her head fills the whole screen. So let's look at it one more time. If you no, ah, never mind, no, that's all right, that doesn't work. No. Let's go on to that one. And this comes from a childhood memory of actually being taken to a town very near the town I was brought up in uh, on Brunel's Great Western Railway where the lines, railway lines, stretch straight in both directions. And you can see trains doing the same thing. At first, they're very small, get gradually bigger, and then the side increases until they're of infinite size. And so I represented her head with a circular blob. And at the top, you have the far distant one that made 11 intervals with 12 in images of her head. And it seemed appropriate that starting with the first one, the diameter of her head relative to the diameter of the field of vision, which is the ink circular ring, should be 1 to 12, that the next one will be 1 to 11, and so on down, 1 to 10, 1 to 9, until you get to the bottom here, where it's 1 to 1. And that represents a sudden increase in size as you get towards the bottom. And then I took that ratio and placed it as a white horizontal line on the black stripe and there it is getting wider as it comes down. Where's the uh, doodah? The This is actually in a conversation with students at lunch today. I was trying to raise the subject of the nature of this curve, which, if I'm not mistaken, is hyperbolic and is symmetrical about a diagonal drawn from that line. So you have that same increase in size. And uh, I found this very intriguing. Um, we've got more about this later, but I want to go on to the next image. Um, so, this is actually a page from the book, and it's an oil painting on the left. And, oh, good, oh, thanks very much, thank you, oh, lovely. Um, yeah, let me use my new toy. There you are, oil painting on the left. Yes, no, exactly right. Yes, that's true. Um, and the connection between this and the last image, I think it's quite close, that here you have the Henley regatta. Uh, that's the regatta course abstracted. And so instead of a leader valley, we have these boats racing towards us who would follow the same rules of perspective. So on the left, you have a conventional view of the regatta course and the left-hand bank of the river with a beautiful willow tree there. And I did this. I'm still working on it, actually. I've been spent about 30 years on this painting. And I'm still doing it. It looks much nicer now than when this was taken. I've really got fascinated by the notion of intense light playing on all the boats. That somehow the light would be representative of the landscape as it would appear about 6 or 7 p.m. on a summer's evening in England, where the, you get heavy atmospheric pollution, dust in the air, and so on. And this is a scene. This is actually a cone of vision with the eye at that point in the middle projected down the course along the regatta course. And I got very interested in the meaning of the edge of the painting. 
is in one sense that will be where the frame is or the mat. But in another sense, I, you're asking yourself, what was the nature of that which is outside of the picture? The same on the other side, too. But is that the edge of the world? In other words, does the painting represent a cone where the apex is in the cyclopean eye of the observer? And is it a cone where that's the base of the cone, which is infinite, and there's some sort of rather like the view of the universe, the Ptolemaic view of the universe, where you had the edge of the world and there was just blackness beyond. Now, the other view is what someone at the vanishing point would see if they were looking forward and that we, we, me, the observer, and the person at the vanishing point sharing a center of vision would see. So th the person at the vanishing point would see the front of objects, but not the back. There would be like a black shadow spreading back from that person's view. And that's what these are. Everything that can't be seen by the observer is projected here. Over here, that's the Munsell R-chrome color sphere, which contains about 578 colors constituting the whole color range. And I realize after time that if you abstract from this model all the colors found in that, then that is merely the same as the painting, only with the colors reorganized. So, because here I had used the color scale, those are colors in light and those are colors in shade, but it's all the idea of analyzing the picture, of breaking it down into little disks to make a matrix, and then using that matrix reordered to represent the colors in their natural sense. Notice that orange strip running along the bottom. Now, at the center point, at the vanishing point, is a little temple. And on the temple, there's a goddess. This is actually a Roman statue of a woman called Vivia. But the goddess is going to watch the rowers and she follows them with her eyes, her right eye on the left rower and the left eye on the right rower. So that her eyes, what I'm going to do is an animation of her eye movements. And she'll appear cross-eyed a lot of the time and it'll look rather funny. But she's representing the allegorical figure of Mother Thames. And it is with a motherly eye she looks after the rowers. Now, here is the same sort of thing going on, where the black outside the image is not really a frame, but it's part of the world that doesn't exist, a non-space. And what I did here, in order to study the perspective of the rowing course, just as I was interested in the perspective of the Wiener Central Friedhof, um, I decided to abstract that image away from the photograph from which it was taken. And so the spectators here might be rather surprised to find the rowing course being taken away from them with their silhouettes still etched into the side of it. And I wonder what that would be like. But here is the, the rowing course being removed. And then this came about because I moved back the winning post so that the photograph was taken just at the magical moment 
of the winning boat crossing the line. So here, the original photograph was taken before the winning boat crosses the line. And by moving the winning post back to touch the prow of the boat, it is indeed capturing that moment of victory. And that, I worked it out, would have to be taken at 0.6 noughts, four of a second after the actual photograph had been snapped to get that magical moment. So finally there you have the expected course ready for analysis. Here, the orange line, mysteriously, no one knows quite what it's doing there, is sliding up over the pages. This is three pages width. Finally, it ends there, and we realize that it's part of another painting. That is a painting of the right-hand side, plan view looking down on the landscape. The river is along there. And this is a conventional plan view, done as an oil painting as well. There's the regatta course. Um, and what I've done here is to imagine a journey at a constant speed, starting at the finish of the rowing course and ending at the start, and the, with a constant speed the whole distance. So here this would be representing an accelerating speed from zero to about 760 miles an hour, using the hyperbola of the earlier slide. Um, take a long time to discover it, but you'd have to read the book for that. Which I don't want to sound like a pug, because there's nothing worse than authors being told, as they are, to plug the book constantly. Um, so what you would do, you would start off very slow here, and if you cover, again, one-twelfth the course, you would be traveling at about 0.02 miles an hour. And then you're speeding up, but the next equal distance subdivision of the course, you would cover more quickly. To accommodate that in the painting, one would have to start to compress the space of the image. Here it would be stretched to infinity, hence the painting going back through the pages. And here it would start to be compressed. Because it was stretched here, it would tend towards the red, the ray, wavelength of red light being longer, and towards the blue over there, because the wavelength was being compressed. All right, let's go on. Now we have a sentimental trip. Oh, no, one more. Another one where the landscape of the, rat, uh, the regatta is conceived as a solidified block. There's the river running through it. And here's the negative shadow, as I might call it, of a willow tree which is there. We are looking from the start of the regatta down towards the finish. And the observer is located there of the perspective. And again, there's the hyperbola at the edge of the course. But now, because it's solidified air, the uh, tree would now appear as a negative. And that's the shadow of the tree breaking through the surface of the hyperbola. And the jiggedy edges there are all the hanging tendrils of the willow tree which would get bigger and bigger as it comes forward. So, okay. And now for a complete change, as it used to say in Monty Python. Um, this is Archigram 1, the sole work of Peter Cook. And what Peter did, because he felt that architecture in London at the time was pretty deadly and dull, as indeed it was. 
England had not really recovered from World War II by then. We're talking about 1961. Believe it or not, I lived in London then, rode my bike around, and there'd still be lots of bomb buildings, and that was about 16 years after the end of the war. So this is a sort of grand cheering up of the architecture scene in London. And so he got together the work of all his pals and those he felt were doing really interesting stuff. And his interests were really Catholic, meaning universal. And you had, for instance, the mosque there done by a one David Green. There's another one somewhere not on this sheet, but on another one, of a guy who was doing medieval-looking drawings, totally different from what Peter was doing. But it was different, so it got included. And there's the furniture building that um, is mentioned in the introduction. There it is. And Peter has actually cut out a photograph of this and written rude words all over it. So you've got skin, um, what does that say? Something or other. Skin again, move. So perhaps he wanted to show that this building is a living, breathing thing and that people move through it and perhaps they're squeezed through it rather like the digestive system. See? This is where it ended up, at, as mentioned, um, at MoMA in 1960. Uh, there's the building there. And there's another one. Um, that's another oil painting done much more recently. Um, so the words that Peter wrote rather haphazardly with a felt tip pen on my building, I set up beautifully, very carefully measured it, so the B and the U and so on, they all are designed and laid out to fit round the curve of the elevator. So they're all compressed at their ends. And this is a vertical section through uh, an exhibition room screening room, there it is on the plan, and you arrive there by elevators, walk through, and they're finger-like extensions which take you into your own row. We call this one the curry powder special because it played within Photoshop, and you get the most wonderful curry-like yellow stuff, eh? Oh, yes. Here's my prompter. Very good. Yes. Now, th there's a funny story connected with this building. Uh, uh, um, <coughs> as was told you, uh, it happened that uh, Rainer Bannum published the building in Architectural Review. And then Arthur Drexler, who was curating an exhibition called Visionary Architecture in New York at the time, saw it and decided to put the show in the exhibition. But prior to that, at the Polytechnic, and this is one thing I feel very much, that the teaching we received at the Polytechnic was efficient, I would say, and very good its intent was to produce fodder for London offices. So one was expected to be a very competent, if unimaginative, architect. So there was a group of us at the Poly who really caused a lot of trouble by doing buildings like this, you see, which wasn't approved of at all. And in fact, there was a student in the year below us called John Hodgkinson, who produced a magazine, inevitably a school magazine, which had to be called Polygon because of the Polytechnic. And he illustrated this building and a few others too. 
And uh, it was then that Rainer Banham saw the article and published it in Architectural Review. But we had associated a new movement in architecture called Bowerlism. So you had a case of Bowerlism, the movement. Um, <laughs> You know, it was a joke movement, but I think our history teacher was a rather pompous man and talked very seriously about m movements in architecture, <laughs> a bit more seriously than we thought he should be, you see. So we thought we'd have to tease him a bit. Um, so hence the name Bowerlism. Now we go on. Um, this building, too, the Sim Palace. I wanted to show this one because I still love this building. And now someone has asked for a model to be made of it, which is a huge class. I was fascinated by my first flight in a jet airliner, which I suppose 1962, when this was done, um, must have being probably the first production model of the B737, the Boeing 737 of that day. But it was amazing because unlike contemporary 737s, if you sat behind the wing, when the plane touched down on the ground, not only you would see the flaps fold down and the spoilers fold up, but also the engine cowling would open up as well to do a bit of thrust reversal. So the whole back of the wing seemed to be undergoing rapid and seemingly disastrous change. And I got so fascinated with the beauty of the wing, the silver sheen on it and so on. And also the fact, funnily enough, that when it was at the airport, at the landing, ready to take off, and the light was coming from above, the wing looked like it was perfectly smoothly manufactured. But if, say, it was dark, nighttime when you arrived, and the light was coming from the side, it looked like a Friday afternoon job in the factory, you know, when he just wanted to get home, and uh, they banged down the old bits of aluminum and left it at that, really rough. Amazing, the difference. So I wanted the model to be slightly rough looking, and it certainly was. And, <laughs> and it's a small image because any bigger and it shows just how shitty the model is. <laughs> but here's a nice bit of computer graphic, you see, showing the cars. And um, all the shine on the metal and so on. So really it's a matter of two systems for the cars where they go up, double climbing ramps, crossovers there, and there, because it's a horizontal section cut, where, of course, the platform, the slab, looks much thicker than it is because you're cutting it on the slant, all that stuff. Um, go on to the next one. Oh. Site in Leicester Square. And there's an elevation of the ramps. And I started to make a model. This was before the age of 3D printing. It's damn difficult to do. I made a model of the straight section of the ramp. And what it does. You're on the camber there, in other words, to throw the car around the curve, the ramp is tilted, but when it goes straight, it needs to be fairly level, but all, and the parking space tilted down so people can look down at the building, and they park on the ramps, get out, and walk onto the platforms. And so I started to carve this, and it took forever. And there's a model. So it's flattish there and then cambered 
hit him with the curve of the ramp as it goes round at the two ends, and so on. So that's another one. That's underneath. And that's with the cars on it. Now, all right, an anecdote, can you stand it? How, how are we doing for time? We don't want to be too long, do we? We'll hurry. Um, all right, so I'm at, actually up in Canada, and I get an email one morning from a friend of mine in New York, a graphics designer, who went to Lambertsville, New Jersey, uh, with a friend of hers, and uh, they had plenty of time. They had an interview with someone. And they arrived half an hour early. They had time to kill. So they went into an antique store, and she noticed in the dusty rear corner of the store this drawing hanging there, and she thought it looked familiar. And she emailed me and said, I think one of your drawings is in a junk store in Lambertsville, New Jersey. And the tab says 1800. There was a little tab in it. <laughs> so I knew Bill Menking, who publishes the Architects newspaper, wanted to obtain the drawing. I said, offer him a thousand. Well, he asked for more than that. But, and I remembered the provenance, as the word is, of the drawing, that I had been asked to do the drawing by a guy who was setting up a collection of drawings in New Jersey, part of the Metro Media collection, and he wanted to obtain it. And so um, I handed the drawing over. I was given a check. I rushed to the bank before he was out of sight and cashed it to make sure everything was okay. It was all right. Um, but then I heard nothing more, and I heard nothing more about the Metro Media collection, and no one ever I've asked has been able to tell me what it was about either. But it shows the structural spiral staircases, um, which are escape staircases, folding one inside the other like a DNA molecule, and then the car ramp rotating around it. I think so. Ah, we go on. I'm going to speed up. <laughs> oh, what are you laughing at? Yes, okay, very funny. Um, I was thinking, this is a, a suit manufactured by the Frankenstein Company. I mean, obviously, you plug it in, and warm water flows through the little channels you can see there. It keeps the guy warm. And in a way, it's a house. It's a tight-fitting house. And if you imagine a much larger version of this with stiffeners, you would have a cube, say. And it's the same thing, but it's in a cubic shape rather than a body-fitting shape. So that you could say that if you... Think of it this size, it's clothing, apparel. And if you think of it as the larger cubic size, it's architecture. But it's the same thing, really. And that led to a project. Oh. Huh. So this is on the top left, a woman with a bald head wearing the suit, uh, fitted to a frame-like chassis so that she could move up and down. And I wanted her to be sort of inflatable like the suit is, so that it fits all together. She's rising up into the vertical position. So you get an assortment of drawings here. On the bottom right, the suit, which is like a string bag. Um, you press it up against a similar string bag 
on the saloon, the room-like structure, and it opens out, such as is shown in the middle there, like that. So you, after the time, you have a parade of suits going round the skin of the saloon. Okay, so I'm going to hurry. What's that? Why do I have tide on there? Um, well, I thought it should, you know, I think I, I'd not been long in America, and I thought, well, America is about commercial and everything. And, <laughs> you know, wh why should not the suit be the same? You know, television is sort of a parade of commercials interrupted occasionally by programming. Ah, I mentioned this at lunchtime today. This is the Lucy Orta suit. She saw the Kushikal and thought there was a connection with her own work. And I agree, there's head-like shapes at the top and arms and legs sticking out. And it's very disquieting, this project somehow, because somehow, instead of the figure being inside the tent or outside the tent, the figure is somewhere suspended within the skin, both in and both out, or neither in and neither out. And I asked her to explain, and she was utterly unable to, and didn't want to either. And really, there's no need for an explanation. It's just delightfully weird. <laughs> but she, I admire her work a lot. Ah, oh, drive in quickly. Yes, typical drive in. Famous picture by O. Winston Link. An extraordinary. When I talked earlier about the miracle of the photograph being taken at the 0 0.000004 seconds before the boat hits the line, so that you have the boat hitting the line recorded in the photograph. Here, Winston Link took the photograph exactly as the jet fighter was about to crash into the train. Don't you think that's amazing? But anyway, standard elements of the drive-in. Rainer Bannum describes it beautifully in A Home Is Not A House. Famous article, if you haven't read it, you must. Beautiful article, all about drive-ins, and he can speak much more eloquently than I about it. But basically, you have an empty piece of ground, equipment to provide the service, and attachments that you can get sound out of, or coke, or whatever you need, or wish. Now, I wonder if this animates. Animation made by Dennis Crompton of Artigram. So there's green or gray units containing heavy stuff that you wouldn't want to move around you, and cars which, when stationed against the uh, service units, become additional living space. They open out to become additional living space. Drive-in house, um, can such uh, hybrid type of architecture be claimed as of interest? Left-hand one, car enters, drum, drum rotates. Schematic house, shown very diagrammatically. Drum rotates. into the house, finally in, uh, the car opens out and is part of the living room. Theory being that perhaps the car sits out on the driveway for 
60% of the day, say, day and night, that maybe if it was brought into the house, it would be used, since especially its internal appointments often exceed those of the house, could it become additional living space? Um, okay. Rooftop view, slits in the skin of the house enable the car when rotating with its headlights on and its taillights on to be visible. A heat diagram showing only temperature gradient as the house car enters the house. The car is seen as an energizer enlivening the interior of the house. Um, pencil drawing where the interior of the car slides out horizontally, there it is. Couple get out. This is really a satire on motel suite. Walk through, undress, shower, uh, step down, Toilet convenient to where one's bottom is, where one is at the bottom. Oh, that you had a shower there, that's right. And then the bed there, where you have hemispherical windows so that you can lie on a summer's night, look up at the stars through the window, and so on. All romantic light. Uh, the last image, uh, rent a wall. Dating from 1966, showing a selectable set of components. There they are, lined up there, components on track, also along there, which then slide round into position and open out to form living space for the couple delighted watching their house forming. Um, the intention was that the night sky, one of the beautiful things about a drawing when one can exaggerate or even downright lie, where the Andromeda galaxy, which apparently is heading towards us in about 15 billion years' time, it will collide with our own galaxy, but there must be an intermediate stage where it fills about 30% of the night sky and what a beautiful object to see this spiral object spiraling through space coming towards us. All right. So, questions, I guess? Oh, okay. Oh, that's about right.